All right. Are you, are you guys ready? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Yeah. So I have done this before, like uh, like two months ago. Um, the slides uh, have not been updated yet, but I think most of the information should be like still uh, valid. So let me try. Uh, you, you guys can stop me anytime if you qu have questions. All right. Uh, let's start. Okay. So basically we have two blockchains, right? So uh, on top you see uh, this, this uh, dark blue uh, represents the Tyco L1 smart contract on the, uh, the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Um, on the lower, in the lower part, we, we see this Tyco client, uh, his, uh, his internal uh, state. As, so those those yellow small boxes are those slots that we have. Um, you know, when people propose block, uh, they put their blocks into those slots. But before I say, uh, I talk about how uh, blocks are proposed, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, um, you, you guys know that uh, transactions on layer two, they are, you know, uh, propagated uh, through the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, through, through, across multiple nodes. Uh, so with each node, you can see uh, a, a lot of transactions in their main pool. Uh, but uh, uh, blocks are not uh, uh, broadcasted to peers. <laughs> Uh, this is very different from uh, Ethereum because in Ethereum, uh, if a miner mines a block, uh, it will broadcast the block to as many peers as possible. And those peers will use their consensus rules uh, to select the best block, right? The block with the, uh, the biggest uh, difficulty. But with Tyco, blocks are proposed by Tyco client into our Tyco L1 contract. So that means each Tyco client will connect to um, one dedicated, not dedicated to to a peer, to a, a L1 node, to communicate to communicate uh, bidirectionally. Um, if the the L1, um, sorry, if the L2 node want to propose a block, it just send a, a special transaction called a propose block to L1, and uh, if there is a block proposed on L1 by other peers, then uh, the L2 node will download that proposed block from uh, L1. So let's say we have uh, four blocks proposed by different L2 nodes already. So you see this, this small face indicates this block is actually invalid. So, so anyone uh, can propose those blocks um, permissionless, and uh, their order are not predefined. So when someone propose, uh, before someone propose the B2 block, the, this, this proposal doesn't specify which block is supposed to be the parent block because in B2, it's just a batch, a batch of uh, uh, transactions. There's no like parent hash, right? So. We, we rely on Ethereum miners to determine the order of these proposed blocks. So once a block is mined into this big uh, queue, um, you know, then its, it's parent is, uh, is set, is determined, um, not the other way around. So uh, this is because if, if, for example, the proposer of B2 say, okay, B1 is supposed to be B2's parent. But somehow if B3 got into the queue first and B1 is still pending and then B2 got into the queue, then B2 will be uh, become like invalid. And which is not good because the proposing uh, process, uh, a broad proposal uh, costs a lot of gas, right? Because there are a lot of data there. You put it onto layer one, it costs gas. So if B2 fails, um, that means the proposer of B2 suffer a loss even it, it help not, helps nobody right because this this assumption is uh, no longer valid so that's why you know when when we propose l2 blocks to l1 we don't specify uh, the parent hash of block um as i said the proposed blocks both mostly just contains a list of transactions, right? And it also has some metadata I will talk about later. But 
as a whole, the proposed block, um, its, its validity is really well defined with a, with a set of rules. And based on those rules, uh, the Tycho client, East Tycho client, knows exactly whether uh, this block is valid or invalid um, without the proofs at all. So at this time, there's no zero knowledge proof, but it's okay because each, each Tycho client can just check the data and then use those uh, validity rules to say, okay, this is valid, this is not valid, right? And valid or, or invalid uh, means something. I, I will talk about that later. Um, it's worth mentioning that uh, this Tycho L1 smart contract cannot access the transactions in these blocks. So it can access the metadata, but not the transaction, because the transaction as a blob data will be part of the, um, the 4844 style data. So um, uh, if you read uh, the 4844, then you know uh, the data is not uh, accessible on the back level. So, so though these validity rules can be used by Tyco clients, but cannot be used by Tyco L1 smart contract. Any, any questions there? Okay. Stop me, stop me anytime you want, all right? So let's say there's a Tyco client. Uh, he, he monitors the L1 uh, smart contract uh, status, uh, and then he, he knows you know, there are blo new blocks proposed. So based on the validity rules, you know, if this block B1 is valid, then the Tycho client will download the proposed block B1, the small b, B1, uh, to its local state and convert it into the real L2 block. So when I say proposed block, they are not really just, they are not really blocks. They are just uh, some data, right? With metadata uh, transaction list. And then, only when this block, proposed block is downloaded from L1, converted to uh, the actual Ethereum style block, then we have a new block on layer two, right? So we can keep downloading the, the good uh, blocks and, and convert them into L2 blocks. All right. Um, let me see. Yeah, so so after each block is downloaded, it, it will be appended to the, uh, to the world state, to the to the block list uh, in the Tycho client. So that that's why I say you know the uh, the blocks are not uh, propagated uh, through layer two network. It's downloaded from uh, a layer one node uh, from this uh, Tycho L one uh, smart contract. All right. So now let's talk about a little bit the uh, the zero knowledge proof part. So here, I add some uh, some small boxes. Um, it, it indicates the uh, block header hash. All right. So the first one is the Genesis block. So it's had a header hash zero. It's zero uh, with a white background indicating this one has been finalized. So the now now the new term uh, in our white paper and and in future will change in our code. We will call this verified. Uh, to because finalized is sometimes uh, confusing, so we call this uh, finalized. Uh, sorry, verified. So let's say we have um, the first zero knowledge proof uh, comes for block B four. So this one is the first one to come, right? And then then uh, this one is the second to come. So once this zero knowledge proof is uh, verified. Um, or validated for block B1, then this block will become verified immediately. So a block is verified if its parent is verified and if it has a zero knowledge proof that proves proves um, the transition from its one from his parents has to his um, declared like uh, uh, like block has. So the proof is actually a, like a link between two blocks. So in other words, there is a possible uh, that there's a possibility that someone just just uh, submit another proof for B1, but it links from another header has to 
uh, a new header class. So even if that's uh, the proof is you know valid, this this block is not verified because the the proof is not used at all. It, it's not used to connect those two uh, blocks. So if because I can I can manage I can edit this. I'll just put it here. So a proof is something between two blocks, right? So this is, sorry for the, so a proof is basically something like this. It, it connects, it's zero to it's one um, based on the uh, blocks data. So it actually has a small part here. So it's like, like this one. So if it's one is, verified and we have this proof then it's uh, sorry it's zero is verified we have this proof and then if um uh, it's one is not verified then we can you know mark a, a, this block as verified <laughs> am i confusing you uh, i i think there must be some questions yeah i, I... That... yeah okay. go ahead <laughs> oh i was gonna say i think that uh part made sense to me at least the proof part um i actually had a slightly not to backtrack i was, had a slightly different question like uh -huh. i think you were saying that you know um, we store the um so the 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 main state root is stored on the tyco l2 right like these green blocks on the bottom like b0 b1 b2 like this is where it'll actually store uh the state root and like uh store the data and uh in like level db or something right like this will actually consume the storage space right uh th these are the stories on l2 yes but on okay, l1 so we, we also have some some stories so these are all the stories but uh, this is not uh, optimized the solution so in later on we will see you know we have some uh, optimization to reduce the stories on l1 Oh, I see. So, and then to build the storage on L2, so like, it does it just take the transactions which are on L1 and then re-execute uh, those like uh, transactions and call data to build up the the storage on L2? Uh, there are actually two ways to um, sync up with the latest uh, block. So the first one is to, uh, you start from the Zenesis block, you download each and every uh, proposed block, you convert them into L2 blocks and then you catch up. And then you 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 raise this latest block, right? The second way is to you connect to a peer. You ask the peer, "Hey, I know the latest, the final, uh, finalized block or verified I block see, is, yeah. is one." And you just give me the state. I, I verify the the state root is this is one. So I just can you know uh, synchronize with peers, but verify um, the peers uh, assertion with the this this is one block hash. Okay, but and but anytime I update that state and I sync it, it needs to re-execute the transactions, right? Right, on right. To build okay. the state, yes, yes. But then I just had one question, like you were saying on L one, like you you can't see. I think you said um, from the dank the dank sharding EIP, like you can't see inside of the transactions. But don't you need to be able to see the transaction and the call data to be able to build the the storage, like build build it on L two? Oh, no, no. So the story is so. Uh, sorry, the. Uh, the H1, the, the the yellow boxes, the proposed blocks have two parts. Um, one is the metadata, which is uh, accessible uh, by the Ethereum uh, virtual machine. The other one is the transaction list. We call it the TX list. They are not accessible there. And they don't have to because those transactions are not going to be executed on L1 at all. So we execute mm -hmm. because uh, the, the whole point of rollup is executing the transactions uh on l2 right so on l2 and and then you you prove off chain and then you say okay uh, after i executed uh all the transactions i have this proof i submit this this proof so so all the post block uh, uh world state hash all the block hash is computed off chain and verified by the zero knowledge proof so you don't have you don't have to see the transactions on l1 okay I, I think i understand but you can still see the transaction like call data on l1 in the transaction list right N no okay. um with 4844 uh, the smart contract doesn't have the byte level access to a transaction list 
Mm, okay. What it can see is only the uh, something called polynomial commitment. So it's kind of like a hash. Uh, so, so that uh, polynomial commitment can be used to verify that uh, this blob of data is actually what is being used to execute those transactions on uh, L2. But uh, from the smart contracts perspective on L1, you, you don't really have access to any data in, in the transaction list. I see. Okay. Right. Okay, and cool. So, sorry to digress there. <laughs> um, no, 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 that's, that's, that's very good. Uh, actually, uh, you know, the, why uh, 4844 is going to make the call data so cheap? Because it doesn't allow access from smart contract. Otherwise, the smart contract will hmm. read those data byte by byte. Then it doesn't make sense to add those uh, new new blockchain, uh, uh, new transaction type, right? Mm. Right. I, have a, so, yeah. I have a question on this realm as well uh, before we move too far off the uh, proof stuff. Uh -huh. um, does the Tyco client itself generate the proof? Um, no. The Tyco client doesn't generate proof. There is a separate prover uh, which connects to a Tyco client. And if this Tyco client uh, turns on uh, mining, you know, there's like uh, Ethereum mining, the concept is, is the same. So it will... Um, if it connects to a prover and turns on mining, then uh, the miner uh, will, uh, based on some algorithm, will say, okay, I want to mine this block. It is not, uh, the proof is not ready yet. I want to mine it. I want to generate the proof. So it uh, communicates with the Tyco client for some um, witness data and then compute the zero-knowledge proof. And then submit okay. the proof directly to uh, Ethereum a node without going through a Tyco client. So the Tyco client is actually just a read only, um, not not read only, just a, act as a normal like Ethereum node. It down it just communicates with layer one, uh, execute all the blocks, and then build the uh, the world state, update the Merkle trees, and then on request will share some uh, intermediate data, uh, which is the uh, witness data data to the prover. So that's all it does. Okay. And then why would I want to pay money to propose a block? A good question. That's uh, part of the tokenomics. We, I will go over later on, but uh, the short answer is um, if you propose a block, um, all the transaction fees on in that block uh, will be given to you. Okay, so it's going to be a race to propose the most profitable blocks, like the kind of thing. Right. Okay, gotcha. And then obviously anybody, because it's permissionless, um, propo and proposing a block doesn't require me to generate the proof, it requires the prover to. So, so submitting a block is quite easy and can be done on inexpensive hardware. Right. Okay, interesting. Uh, right. Yeah, I think that's so, all I have right now. Right. So there's a there's actually a very good uh, uh, challenge there because let's say um, most of the transactions are uh, broadcasted to the peer to peer network on layer two, and then if you Jeff uh, want to propose block, I want to propose block. If we use the same algorithm, we may end up with proposing very similar blocks, right? And then that will mean you know. Um, it's a waste of time because you know if you, your block uh, was included in, in layer on layer one before mine, then a lot of my transactions will be just duplicate and will be just skipped over. I will talk about that later, but uh, it's a waste of yeah. Time. So, so, so having a having a transaction that has already happened in a previously proposed block um, does not make my block invalid. It just skips those when processing. Right. Right. So, and and I think I remember that an RLP encoded empty transaction list is a valid block. So if we submit exactly duplicate blocks, you and I, and mine gets approved, you will actually pay to be proving an empty block or proposing a completely empty block. Yes. And it will be valid. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. And then, and if it gets proved, then that would obviously get put on the chain as an empty block. Right. But nobody oh. would prove it because it wouldn't make them any money. No, no, no. And they, uh, uh, even the bad block, those invalid block, needs to be proved proven. Oh, that's right, because they get the fee. Or, no, yeah, sorry, but 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 what do they get money for? Uh, from the proposer, the proposer will end up losing money because uh, it gets nothing from layer two, but still has to pay the prover the proving fee. 
Oh, they, they get the proposal fee. I thought they got transaction fees from the transaction list for, for proving. No, no, pr the prover doesn't get anything from uh, on layer two. It, it only gets a fee from the proposer. Uh, so I have, I, will, I have a picture to show those interactions later on. So uh, okay. yeah, tokenomics. Yeah, so, uh, so in, Daniel, in this, mm -hmm. just Sorry. one more question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, while proposing, we don't have uh, any block ordering. Um, so right. when, when do we actually get that data that uh, B2 follows B1 and B3 follows B2? So, uh, so they are proposed independently, right? So uh, the Ethereum miner will see those proposals as Ethereum transactions. So once the transactions mines into uh, Ethereum, then uh, you know the the state in this smart contract will change to say, okay, now B1 takes this slot is the second. A block, or if this is a genesis block, this is the first block, and this is a second block. So the first block will be the parent of the second block. So the order is determined when the second block is included uh, in this queue. Okay, so it, it just depends on when a particular L2 block was included uh, on uh, or, or proposed on L1. Exactly, exactly. So it, it also means you know, inside each proposed block, the order of uh, transactions it is determined by uh, the block's proposer, but the whole block ordering is depend uh, depending on the Ethereum miners, not us. Okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So as I said, you know, there is very little change here. So now the third zero knowledge proof comes for this invalid block. Um, so this invalid block is will be marked as um, proven. And then uh, the fourth one comes, and then this one is verified. This one is proven, assuming you know the, this this proven block assumes its parent is this one. So it will boom. You know, these three are all verified. So the proofs can be submitted out of order, right? You can submit proofs for any pending blocks here, uh, but, uh, you know, occasionally, you know, the verification of blocks can, uh, where, you know, it will move forward by more than one uh, uh, blocks. It can, you know, like this one, you know, it's just moved to three blocks. Um, oh, sorry. So is the proof for block four generated with the assumption that the invalid block three is the parent or like how does that, does the parent block affect the proof in some way? Uh, oh, that's, that's a good question. So when someone uh, try to prove this B4 block, right? It, it must know that this one is invalid. It, therefore the, it's, it's parent should be this one. So, this this prover will run all the transactions uh, in uh, all the blocks till B2, right? Get the parent hash. Because at this moment, we don't even know, on layer one, we don't even know this is, uh, the hash is, is, is two yet, right? Nobody knows, right? So, but this guy, this prover knows because he run all the transactions from B0, B0 B1, B2. And no, now he knows the um, post B2 state hash should be, H2. And then we try to, uh, he also knows this one is invalid, so there's no uh, real block here. Uh, and then he runs B B4 and convert it to B3. Now he knows for B3, the parent has is whatever has he, he had after running B2, and the new has is like it's three. So the proof will tell, in, will, will tell that uh, uh, is from H2, to H3. So it, it jump it jump over this B3. So when we connect these, we will say, okay, now B B B2. And then this one is invalid. It, it goes nowhere. And this one it actually should be like this. It, it, it connects to uh, the previous one. Like this one. So the, uh, because it's very easily defined if a block is valid or not. Even if something hasn't been proven yet, the Tyco client knows whether a block is valid or invalid very easily, so it can determine this chain, right? Right, right. Okay, gotcha. 
Right. So here you, you also see that uh, B3 doesn't have a corresponding uh, L2 block because it's invalid. So it's, it's skipped over. Uh, all right. Um, so we don't have unlimited um, number of slots. So after all those uh, 10, 24 blocks are used, we are going to reuse uh, the first one. Um, if this first one has been verified. Otherwise, um, proposing more blocks will be uh, disallowed. You cannot do that. So we, we keep up to uh, 1024 uh, blocks. But this number is just a, you know, a, a example. In reality, we don't really use this number, but uh, it just say you know, it's a, a limited number of slots that you, you can use. And afterwards, you, you will just uh, reuse. This is because the the proposed block takes quite some data on chain. So for the first 1024 blocks, it will be more expensive, but afterwards when the slots are reused, you know, it is uh, going to be very inexpensive because the other uh, S store will change uh, some non-zero to another, uh, some other non-zero values. So it's not going to be uh, very expensive. Okay, um, let me talk about the, the proposed block and you know the validity rules. So uh, a proposed block has two set of data. The first data is the metadata. Meta is very simple. So it, it still, it doesn't specify the parent information, but it has uh, um, some other information which is uh, pretty uh, useful. For example, the beneficiary, this is the address uh, the proposer uh, choose to receive L2 uh, transaction fees, right? So all the transactions, uh, they pay fees on layer two. So this one, this address is the layer two fee recipient address. Um, the ID will be automatically assigned once this block is mined into the L1 smart contract. Uh, L1, uh, hate and has are the uh, latest known uh, L1, um, L1 hash and block uh, number uh, to the L2's uh, uh, node software. And it used to, to do the, uh, the bridge uh, data synchronization. So I think uh, 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 Jeff may be really interested in these two. Um, gas limit is, you know, you specify what's the maximum gas limit uh, that this whole block can consume. Uh, the proposed is the, the time uh, is also uh, automatically assigned by the uh, Tyco uh, L1 smart contract. Uh, the transaction list hash is used to uh, to check whether the transaction list is um, um, consistent uh, with this hash, right? So in the future, this one will, this field will be removed and we will use the uh, polynomial uh, commitment. There are some other uh, uh, data I don't really recall, but in the white paper, you can understand the, those details. But in general, the, it, we, we have very limited amount of data on chain, which can be used, be updated by the uh, Tyco L1 smart contract. Uh, the majority of the data is the transaction list, which could be very uh, large. Uh, as I said, the transaction list is a, is a binary a blob. Uh, it's the RLP encoded list of transactions. Um, the content not accessible uh, to to, con to smart contract on L1. Uh, the metadata and, and transaction list can determine the, the uh, conversion to the actual L2 block. All right, so let me see. So the when a block is submitted, uh, we do some basic uh, validity check on L1 to, to verify the block uh, metadata. But we don't do transaction list validity check on L1 because first the, uh, the transaction list as blob is not accessible from L1. Secondly, the check is going to be very expensive because uh, you, you need to decode a lot of data. You need to run through all those transactions and check a lot of things. Uh, like signatures, you know, stuff. You don't you don't want to do that. It's, it's very expensive. And secondly, you know, it requires a context, right? So you, you cannot say this transaction is valid without saying 
you know, the current uh, message sender's nonce uh, is this value, right? So if you don't have the, uh, the current world state, you don't, you cannot tell whether a transaction is valid or not. So um, because of these, uh, these reasons, we don't do uh, transaction list uh, check here in, uh, on L1. So these are the rules that the L2 node will use to check the, um, uh, check the validity of the block. Uh, we'll, I, we'll probably come back to, for, to, to review these later, but uh, you just remember there are a lot of a, a list of rules, right? Um, the, it's, it's, there are two ways to, to verify or to check the proposed blocks validity. Uh, first one is you create a separate circuit, then you do that. So uh, if we do that, we will uh, you know, submit two different type of proofs, one for uh, valid blocks, one for invalid blocks. Uh, the other way is we, we don't want to create a separate circuit. Instead, we create a separate uh, block on L2, and then on that L2, we provide this transaction list and say, okay, um, you do the check on L2. And then we uh, use a valid zero knowledge proof to, uh, to verify this uh, L2 block. Um, it's, it's a little bit confusing, but uh, maybe I'll come back to that later. Um, let, let me try to do this. This picture may be good enough. So, okay, let's, to, let's say I want to prove B3 is invalid, right? How, how can I do that? I create a temporary block. This block, uh, his, his parent is B2, right? And in this block, I have only one transaction called invalid block. I put this transaction list of B3 into uh, the parameter. And then I create, a, I generate a valid zero knowledge proof for this temporary block B and I submit that block. So if that proof is uh, verified to be valid, then this block is valid, right? So in this block, uh, sorry, on, on L1, the smart contract will verify that this block, um, the first transaction is indeed this invalid block transaction, right? And its, um, it's, it's address is actually the L2. We do a bunch of check just to make sure that uh, this invalid block transaction retains the right data, uh, which means this, this transaction internally um, verified for us that B2's uh, transaction list is invalid. Is that confusing? <laughs> I think it's confusing. Um, okay, let me try, try it again. <laughs> um, to, to prove a block is invalid, there are two approaches. The first one is create a custom circuit to verify the block is invalid. The second one is to reuse uh, L2 EVM uh, with a special transaction that we defined called invalid block. The input of this invalid block is the L2, uh, is the B3 transaction list. And then we just uh, make sure in this temporary block, this transaction uh, succeeds uh, without throwing any error, which means this transaction has proven to us on L2 that uh, this B3 block is indeed invalid. Now we just need to prove this block itself is, is valid with a normal valid zero knowledge proof, right? So, so this, this proof is still just like any other proof, but for this block, not for the B3 block. So once this one, this proof is uh, verified, we know this, this B, this gray block, this temporary block is valid. And then we check its internal transaction. The first transaction is invalid block. We check the, uh, the input um, is the actual TX list, uh, the transaction list for B3. And we also check that uh, this transaction doesn't throw an error. And then we indirectly, we prove that this B3 block is invalid. 
questions? So I'm gonna guess that um, we the, basically this whole process takes place on like a separate function call on the L1 contract instead of like propose block. I'm gonna call call like uh, uh, prove one is invalid, and I'm gonna submit this temporary block there, and it still uses the proof, but at the end it doesn't like update or like set this block anywhere. It just sets the state of that other block, right? And then this temporary quote temporary block which is really just kind of a function parameter a function argument um uh it gets discarded on our chain right right so so this one is only temporarily um available um there's there's this block is only visible to the prover itself it doesn't even um uh, so this this temporary block is not even submitted to l1 only is has is submitted to l1 okay gotcha so then like on that l1 contract we we i guess like like de we, we decode it we get the logs like you say we check whether the event has that function whether mm -hmm. it has that and if that's true we can like verify that in like the merkle tree exactly uh, we, yeah okay we prove okay cool I, i'm beginning to get then we like prove the blocks invalid now everyone knows it's invalid um, and you get, and that guy gets the fee. That guy gets the, the 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 guy who proposed the blocks fee. So it's actually like he's. You would want to do this as a, as 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 someone quote mining quote because even just the business of proving invalid blocks is profitable. Exactly, exactly. So for prover, it doesn't matter. It's a, a valid block or invalid block. It's the same. Yeah, although it might be easier to prove an invalid one uh not necessarily true let me see um can't you can if you hit a condition on why it's invalid can't you prove that quicker than having to prove everything in it is valid say the say the first transaction out of 100 is invalid can't you just simply prove that and then it they, they can say because this is true the whole block is invalid i don't care what else is in this so the the, mm. the the invalidation proof could be theoretically very cheap to compute yeah it's it's possible we don't know the data yet but uh, since this temporary block only has one transaction so it's fair to assume it should be um, computationally cheaper than a really large valid block yeah, but I'm just thinking in my head, there might be people who just try and find invalid blocks because it's easier to run the computations and it still makes money, which would it's obviously possible, be good for us. On the other hand, to prove this invalid block, there are actual uh, uh, checks on L1, for example, the Merkle, uh, Merkle proof verification, right? To verify that it is in the, in the transaction receipt, um, you know, there is a so there's no error everybody everything is expected so there are extra checks on l1 so i don't know you know if we um calculate both the off-chain proof generation cost and the on-chain uh transaction cost i don't know which one is more expensive um but true, right because you need to follow the receipts route back and right. make sure that your invalidate block receipt is actually right valid right if in the merkle right. tree of the first proof yeah right so here i think one one thing i want to mention is that uh, you know for each proposed block there is a gas fee parameter uh the value is chosen by the proposer right the actual cost covering both the off-chain proving cost and the on-chain uh, uh proof transaction cost the cost the, the total cost may not be linear to the number that uh, the proposer uh, specified. So that's why in the tokenomics, we don't really use that uh, gas limit, uh, you know, uh, provided by the block proposers. But I'll come back to that later. So, so in, in general, this whole solution tries to reuse uh, the valid block zero knowledge proof circuits without introducing a new one for invalid blocks. Um, that, that's the whole point. Okay, shall I proceed? Next one? Yes, please. Uh, it is, it's the same one. So, 
Okay, so th this one is done. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the conversion from a proposed block to actual block on, on L2. Um, I actually covered this a, a little bit. So uh, when B1 is converted to the capital B1 actual block, we choose the B0, the genesis block as the parent. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, here he's, is a very important uh, uh, information for the conversion. So let's say, so, so B1 is, is a valid block, but being valid doesn't mean all the transactions in B1 are valid. So uh, if, if B1 has a transaction whose nonce is incorrect, then this, this nonce, uh, this incorrect uh, transaction will be filtered out. So it, it means, you know, we, when we do the conversion, the transaction list um, will be parsed over by the Tyco client and then all the transactions with invalid nouns always, uh, all the all the all the all the ether balance of the message sender is uh, is smaller than uh, a specified number by the Ethereum uh, specification. So if those two errors uh, are there, then these these transactions will be filtered out. So the so the actual block transaction is a subset of the proposed block transactions. So this is very, very important. As I said, you know, the block validation cannot be done on um, L1 because on L1, we don't have these contexts. These are the, the context-based uh, transaction validation, the nouns and the uh, ether balance of the message sender. So when the L2 do the conversion, it's just, uh, you know, for any blo uh, valid blocks, it will filter these transactions. So do, is the reason that we pick number two just to guarantee them to not revert? Because I mean, you, you can still revert for a million other reasons. Um, do we just pick this one because they will obviously fail? Uh, yes, and these... So all these validity proofs are part of the Ethereum specification. You, you add them together, we split those rules into two sets. One set is those easier ones uh, that can be done independent of the uh, execution context. These two are the, the context dependent validation rules. So those rules are going to be uh, uh, you know, applied when we do the conversion and these two rules will be uh, uh, part of the, the circuits uh, uh, so, so that even if we prove this block is valid, the circuit will also say these two transactions are not valid because one, you know, they they have problem with either nouns or the ether balance. So we have the corresponding proof to support that we can filter out these transactions. Gotcha. Right. So, so we, in general, as I said, and I re, I'm repeating myself, in general, I, we don't invent um, like a new validity rules. It's all Ethereum white, a yellow paper specification. We just split them into uh, con contextual validation and uh, non-contextual validation. So make, to make sure, you know, these contextual ones are actually part of the zero knowledge proof so that we can just, uh, you know, easily filter them out when we do the uh, conversion here. Um, is this filtering sufficient to like prevent malicious transactions from going through? Like, is it a guarantee? Yeah, it is a guarantee. So, okay. Yeah, if when, if this nonce, um, if everything is is if everything is valid, right? Then you just uh, run the transaction on L two to update the world state. Otherwise, you just don't don't run it. Actually, when you do the conversion, this uh, if those invalid transactions are not part of this. Block, block at all. You, you don't see those transactions here in, in B1, in big in capital B1. You don't see the those transactions. Mm -hmm. So of course they don't run. But uh, for them, this is this is interesting. So I say, you know, in B1, you don't see those invalid transactions with, with invalid nouns or surface interface in the Easter balance. Um, I say that it's true for normal layer two client. But if this layer two client is trying to prove this B1 block. 
it will run things differently. It will still run those transactions uh, by generating some error messages, some intermediate uh, uh, output, the witness. Those witness are uh, necessary to generate the proof for this block. But otherwise, if you're just a normal client, you don't want to run a prover, then you don't have to run these invite transactions. So, so basically on, on L2 node, there are two modes. The first mo mode is normal. So you filter all these transactions. The second one is you don't filter it, uh, th those invalid transactions. You still run them, but you uh, end up with, uh, you, know, you have to undo everything, right? Because uh, th these transactions cannot be run at all. Uh, the Ethereum client will probably just, uh, uh, Throw an exception if you run a transaction whose nonce is uh, is incorrect. Um, you know, so for those you you don't you don't run it at all. So only the mining um, clients can have only the valid filtered transactions. Only the mining client will run those invalid transactions. Oh, invalid generate, ones. Okay. To generate the some necessary. Uh, execution trace logs for the prover to, to run. Because the prover not only proves those, tra those, tra those valid transactions must be executed, it also must prove that those invalid transactions must not be executed. Uh, so, so that's the point. Yes. Okay. So actually it's, it's here. So, so uh, this is what I covered. So, so it should support an option to run those invalid transactions uh, to generate the, the trace. Okay. Uh, okay. The anchoring. Um, let me see. So, there for each Tyco uh, block, the first transaction is uh, very special. Uh, it's called uh, the anchor transaction. Um, the transaction, I think that the, these slides are not well written. Um, based on my memory, the, the anchor transactions are there for two, main, main, mainly two purposes. The first pr purpose is to make sure um, some public input data for the ZK EVM is part of the Merkle tree. For, let me give you one example, all right? So, there's there's opcode to return um, one of the latest two hundred and fifty six block hashes, right? Uh, Jeff, do you do you still remember like those called block hash? This this uh, solidity uh, function is called a, a block hash. You you give a number a, a block number, it will return the block hash, but only for the latest uh, two hundred and fifty six. Yeah, it's uh, it's get synced header if I remember right. Right, but this return the value is not part of the Merkle tree. So, so that means um, when you generate the proof, uh, there's, there's a bug there, right? So if, if this, this return the value for block hash is not part of the Merkle tree, how can you tell this, this return value is correct? Because ZK EVM only uh, covers three uh, major uh, uh, like data, the type of data. First is the uh, the transactions uh, signatures, right? Uh, so it's the signature proof. And then it's the Merkle proof or the state proof uh, or the storage proof. They call it differently, but it's just the Merkle tree. And then this execution proof to, to prove that given the right input, you get uh, the right output by the, by, the Z, by the EVM. But the block hash returned by this, uh, this uh, public function of uh, solidity, the input is not part of the Merkle tree. So you don't have a way to, to, tell, to, to say, you know, this input is correct. So how, how can we do that? We have to uh, keep those latest 256 hashes as part of the Merkle tree from the layer two's Denise block. So you have always have to do that. So that's something that we have to do with, with the, uh, the anchor transaction. All right, so um, and the other one is the 
I have, I have a quick question on that regarding the anchor transaction. Mm-hmm. I've looked around that code a little bit. Um, and it has a function called like check inputs or something when you right and it just probably yeah, 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 that one. Um, what does that actually do to make sure that you know it's 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 very it's like what what does that actually um uh verify? Okay, maybe I can just uh, share this this screen. Let me see. Here, uh, this anchor transaction has this check public inputs function, right? So here. Uh, right. in, in, in English rather than code, like what, what do we want to verify here? Um, we want to verify that the latest 256 hashes um, I are valid by, based, uh, by comparing them with the information we have stored in the Merkle tree. So from Genesis, we know the Genesis, Genesis uh, broadcast uh, is valid, right? We have this assumption. And uh, when we have the first block, we have to somehow store the, this first blocks uh, broadcast into the Merkle tree so that in the next block, in the second block, uh, uh, when Solidity is providing this uh, this in, this uh, return the value for broadcast uh, one. Then we check with the storage version of this hash to make sure you know the the, the solidity uh, the, the EVM returned the right code, the the right value. So basically, you don't trust the EVM uh, for the return value of broadcast. You verify you you you, ma- you check with the Merkle tree version. To make sure it's um, it's valid. Same and what thing. if the what what if the previous two hundred fifty six hashes are not valid? Like one of them is not valid. What happened there? How how did that happen? Well, if doing if you if having this under transaction, there's no not possible. To, you know, it, it's invalid. But if you don't do that, don't do it. Right. Let's say you comment out this this function, then. All those 256 block hashes are just random value that you don't know whether they are valid or not. So that's why you have to keep track of uh, the new block hash in the storage after each block so that when you use the latest uh, uh, block hash, you, you, you confirm by like uh, comparing with the, uh, uh, the storage version of the, of the hash. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. So if if um, for for Ethereum client, this block hash is just a random value returned managed by the node because the node of course won't return invalid value, um, but based on the consensus, each node maintains its own knowledge about the latest two hundred fifty six uh, hashes, uh, and then you know if they have returned the uh, incorrect value, this value. Uh, will be used in the next block, and then the transaction, the whole block will end up with a very different uh, uh, block hash. Uh, once this block is broadcasted uh, based on consensus rules, all the peers will reject it because it, it's incorrect, right? So nobody on layer one is willing to provide invalid return value for those uh, 256 uh, block hashes. But here, we can fool the smart contract on layer one. If, if there's no way to verify this, um, because there's no consensus on layer two, right? So you have to make sure this value, uh, um, the, the broadcast value are right, are, are correct. So that's that's why we, we have to do this. Okay, gotcha. We get all previous blocks, we hash them all together, and then we compare what people are inputting. And if it's the same, then we're good. And if not, then um, it would be it would be easy to e- easy to spoof basically. Uh, right here, this this one is important. This line because basically we just store this uh, hash here, right? So so we 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 keep some information in the stories, uh, which is the Merkle tree, right? Uh, so that later on we can always use the Merkle proof to make sure you know if we compare these values and the Merkle proof is still valid, then. Uh, sorry, the, not the Merkle proof. The, the zero knowledge proof for the Merkle tree is still valid. Then you know everything is valid. Why do we store the height Medulo two five five instead of just the height? 
uh, here? Yeah. Uh, I think it's just the optimization to reduce the storage uh, footprint to make sure we only right. store up to this amount of data, not uh, all the history, and it will be very expensive. So this one, after 256, it will be less expensive because we are always using the same slot. Gotcha. Okay. Right. The other, uh, uh, besides the 256 uh, uh, block hashes, there's also this this uh, chain ID, right? The chain ID is not part of the Merkle tree either. So you have to uh, store the chain ID, uh, you know, uh, first. And then for every block, you, you always check this chain ID is the same as the previous, uh, as the uh, Genesis chain ID. You don't want to, uh, uh, otherwise, you know, for each block, the chain ID can change and there's no way to verify that. So these are the two very important thing to, to verify. Make sense. So, um, yeah, so basically all that part that uh, asked about that is after that, you can now sync a, um, if, if that, if that, if that function runs okay, you can now anchor and sync and update the latest header basically. Right. Right. So the, the, the other one is the synchronization. I think, uh, uh Jeff, you already know that. So basically it's a way, it's a way to, uh, where, where is it? Oh, is is okay. Um, forget it. Um, so the, the the third one is the the base fee. The base fee uh, right now is zero because uh, the current L two implementation doesn't support EIP fifteen fifty nine yet. So if this this is uh, uh, supported, you know the base fee will also be saved into uh, the stories. All right. So okay, this this one is the last one. So it's very. Um, let me see. Um, generating an L two block. So you download these data. This the screen uh, background blocks the block metadata and trajectories list from the L one uh, queue. Um, uh, you on L two, you know the current block, which will become the parent block of of the next uh, block. And then those uh, public inputs, public inputs are uh, supplied by the client, and then we verify them with the anchor transaction as the first uh, uh, transaction in the transaction list. And then we just run transaction one by one, uh, unless we uh, uh, find some transactions are invalid because the nonce is out of uh, the order or the uh, ether balance is insufficient. So we skip over those unless we want to prove this block and then we run over the these transactions and then redo uh, a cleanup. Uh, so basically that's that's uh, how the L2 node uh, will you know uh, get a new block from from L1 by by converting not by uh, requesting from the from its peers. All right so this is this is about uh, the the core part uh, of the protocol without uh, the tokenomics. Uh, oops, Jeff is gone. Who is still here? Let me see who is still here. Jeff is back. Oh, Jeff is back. Okay. I got uh, my internet crapped out. Thank you. Okay, Jeff, you didn't miss much, but uh, here, you know. Uh, did you hear this part? Uh, I've only been gone about a minute. We we just got to the slide, and then you were kind of reading over the the header and stuff. Oh, oh it's it's the same. Yeah. So the the L two client uh, download um, block metadata transaction list from L one and use its knowledge about the current uh, parent block, and then um, it is the the EVM you know supplies the the public input. The anchor transaction is the first one to run to verify these inputs are correct, and then um, go over each and every transactions in the list, and uh, you know um, bypass the uh, incorrect one. And then we have a L2 block. So the L2 blocks are derived from L1 proposed blocks. Um, L L2 knows uh, they don't really get new blocks from peers, but they uh, they download and, and derive. So that's basically the the core protocol.